thanks for um, carrying over the uh, registration and joining us tonight. Um, we thought it was important as per the publicity notice to give some um, time and attention to developments that are going on in the what I call the other jurisdictions. It's not all about England, a lot of the media coverage in um, certainly in the English and a lot of the educational press focuses on the English system, but it's very important that we keep an eye and aware of developments in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, because as we all know, those jurisdictions have their own uh, responsibilities for education, their systems have developed and are developing in different ways with different pressures and different interests uh, coming to the fore and different uh, issues around qualifications and assessment etc. Um, they've evolved over time differently and there are proposals coming along which will see them evolve further and I think it was important and we thought it was important to give people an opportunity to hear what some of those developments are. Um, and that really is the context for tonight. So we're delighted that we've got a speaker from each of the three uh, jurisdictions. And if you've seen the publicity note, you'll see we've got um, Margaret Farragher from SQA, Kevin Palmer from Wales, and Michael McCauley from Northern Ireland. And they can say a little bit more when they speak in turn. And what I've suggested is that we um, go to Northern Ireland first and we cover the jurisdictions in alphabetical order. So I'm going to ask Michael to speak first, um, then Margaret, then Kevin. And as I say, please do use the chat facility throughout the presentations and then we'll come back to um, the Q&A once the three speakers have made their inputs. So Michael, over to you. Thank you, Simon. Um, and it is just to get the slides up in here. I think everybody can see that now. Um, it's lovely to um, join you all this evening. Um, uh, look, folks, I, th I think um, I will qualify by saying that I'm sure uh, what Margaret and uh, Kevin will, will will say when when it comes around to their turn will be slightly more interesting than what um, is happening here in Northern Ireland. Um, I think first and foremost, for, for those for those of you who have not experienced um, the, uh, I suppose, the Northern Ireland education system, it is important to, to set out some context so you understand really where we're coming from. Now, um, obviously, you, you will be familiar with the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, and it essentially set up devolved government in Northern Ireland. Now, it was established in December 1999, and the way that it operates is that we we need a coalition of at least two parties to form an executive, and that is very much reflective of the historical context of Northern Ireland. Now, they will um, oversee nine departments, one of which is included in education, and the way that those departments are divvied out, so to speak, is using um, an electoral tool called De Haunt. Um, and that obviously, again, is reflective of the fact that, that we have a, essentially a mandatory coalition where you have parties representing the 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 um, polit different political and religious affiliations here in Northern Ireland. Um, now, while there will be different ministers and different parties um, who will also have different priorities, the same in any of the other devolved administrations, for example, like with Labour and Conservatives, they will have competing priorities. The way that a legislative change would be introduced here in Northern Ireland is if the Northern Ireland executive, which is made up of the coalition parties, has to agree to it. So it is slightly more complex and it does mean that it is slightly more difficult to introduce change. So I think that that was why I thought it was important to spell that out from the outset. Now, another problem that we have is the fact that just because of the nature of Northern Ireland, there does tend to be the odd fallout from uh, from time to time, and there have been a number of lengthy suspensions. So it works out roughly at a, since 1999, approximately 40% of the, the the time has been has seen the executive um, suspended, and that actually includes currently, um, where we've had a situation where um, the the exec executive has been suspended um, from February of last year right through to the um, present day and, and obviously that suspension doesn't seem any 
and it doesn't seem as if it's going to lift anytime soon. So just wanted to set some context for you. Um, now, the way that we operate here as well is obviously because it is devolved, we have, have our own curriculum with our own uh, particular priorities. It was introduced in 2007. It covers all 12 years of compulsory education right up until 16, and it focuses on, a num on the learning process. So positive learning experiences, assessment for learning, and, and learners' needs, as well as their knowledge, understanding, and skills. It does offer a good degree of flexibility um, to schools and specifies a minimum entitlement for all pupils in each area of learning, which you will see in, in the graphics that will follow this slide. Now, schools then also have considerable scope to tailor this entitlement, depending, say, for example, on the needs of the student, where exactly the schools are based, where it's urban or rural, um, so to speak. So, so they have the ability to adapt the learning and the delivery of the curriculum to their own context and to the needs of their students. Now, obviously, because, you know, the focus here is, is, is probably, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm correct to say more on uh, post-primary. I'm just going to quickly run through the uh, curriculum at Key Stage 3, and then I'll come into Key Stage 4, which will lead me nicely into um, qualifications. So this, this is called the big picture, and it's essentially a diagrammatical representation of the um, priorities associated with the Northern Ireland curriculum. So we will have our curriculum aim and our objectives. And um, you will see then learning for life and work plays a, a big part um, in the Northern Ireland curriculum. We then have our key elements presented, such as uh, spiritual awareness and personal health. We then move into the cross-curricular skills that it is the responsibility of all subject teachers to deliver um, the likes of communication, using mathematics and using ICT. And then also as well, thinking skills and personal capabilities. Again, these are five key areas, managing information, working with others, thinking, problem solving and decision making, self-management and uh, being creative. Then we move into the nine areas of learning, um, which um, uh, all, all students must have access to at Key Stage 3. Their learning experiences, a key element or a key building block in all of this, as I mentioned already, is assessment for learning. And that is obviously to try and sort of build ownership into the whole learning process and get our students much more involved in the likes of target setting, peer review and so on. And then the um, different attitudes and dispositions associated with that. Now, moving then on into key stage four, and, and this uh, is one of the key building blocks, obviously, for the qualifications that we then offer. So again, follows the same structure, but just to point out there, um, there when we move down to areas of learning, there are three statutory that are identified, learning for life and work, physical education, and religious education. Now, in each of those, it, it is the responsibility of a school to ensure that students are exposed to them, but they do not have to formally assess them for example, through a GCSE, but they do need to ensure that students are having experiences in those areas. Okay, and then it follows very similar patterns to um, the key stage three uh, um, big picture, but again, with another key difference, and that is the statutory um, requirement that students are exposed to one third applied subjects and one third general um, at GCSE out of um, a list of 21 different courses. Now, the way that, um, because Northern Ireland is relatively small and our schools tend to be smaller than those in England and Wales, what we try to do is ensure that there is a degree of collaboration between schools in, um, uh, in geographical areas uh, and those learning partnerships are what are tend to be um, used to ensure that students are getting full exposure to all of those 21 courses. Now, uh, moving then on to qualifications then. Now, while education is a, dev is, is a devolved matter and, and, and Kevin and Margaret will share the, the, the same message, we are in a three country arrangement with England and Wales for the delivery of GCSE and A-level qualifications. Now, I've already shared the big picture with you at Key Stage 4, so there is also a requirement on us as an awarding organisation or an educational um, body in Northern Ireland to ensure that we are meeting the requirements of the Northern Ireland curriculum. So learning for life and work, PE and RE, which have already um, drawn to your attention, and then the entitlement framework, the 21 subjects, one third general and one third applied. So we, we have to try to be as flexible as we possibly can. Now, primarily, 
Um, the qualifications that we do offer here in Northern Ireland are GCSE and A level. Um, they will have the same title and similar content and assessment arrangements to those in England and Wales because of the um, because of the three country arrangement. And also as well, we have an open qualifications market. So the qualifications offered in England and Wales can actually be taken by schools here in Northern Ireland with one key exception and that are GCSEs offered in Wales. And that is because of the different GCSE um, grading skills that are in place, which obviously um, has complicated matters, I think you know, pretty much since 2017 and um, the uh, reform of qualifications that was associated with that time period. Now also as well, there are a small, um, we have also developed a small number of qualifications here to reflect the Northern Ireland context and um, ones that I would sort of uh, you know draw your attention to would be the likes of software systems development. Now it is a qualification that we offer at post 16 and it is very much focused on um, software development and programming and that is very much reflective of, of, a, of an IT industry here in Northern Ireland that is very much um, booming. It is one of the real success stories of the last 10 or 15 years here. So you can see that we are obviously trying to do what we can to ensure that we're reflecting the needs of industry and employers here as well. Now, some other key differences that I would like to point out to you about the qualifications that we offer is that we would still have um, quite uh, a lot of qualifications. The majority of our qualifications would still be unitized, which isn't the case in England, where there is um, a, a much bigger focus on linear qualifications, both at GCSE and A level. So ourselves and Wales are still flying the flag for unitized qualifications. Now, it has actually led to a lot of issues, obviously, in the post-COVID um, uh, period, and also as well as we were responding to the pandemic, um, unitization um, did prove to, to um, present an awful lot of challenges for us. Um, we also here do still have the, the um, AS qualification as part of the overall GCE. So the contribution of AS um, is 40% to the overall GCE qualification that students um, will sit um, at post 16. Um, uh, and that's again, similar to Wales, but in England, you know that AS is decoupled. And we also have a different uh, GCSE grading scale than would be the case in England. England, the, group, the GCSE grading skill is nine to one. Here it is still um, A star to G, but we have introduced a C star grade and that was introduced in, in 2017 and first award for GCSE qualifications in 2019. Now also as well, because of the open qualifications <laughs> market, we still have a number of regulated qualifications from levels one to five. And lastly, then challenges that, that I would foresee um, over the next while for us then is continue to embed the Northern Ireland curriculum, although it's been in place for 13 or for 15 years, there are still some challenges and COVID hasn't helped. We also have to deal with the fallout from the pandemic. We have our continuing divergence in qualifications um, between England, Wales and Northern Ireland. There's a number of reports that we are having to work through as an educational body. And also as well, we have, you know, we're working in the context of the absence of the Northern Ireland executive, which does make things um, a lot more challenging. So more than happy to take questions once the other speakers have um, had their opportunity to speak. And sorry for taking up slightly more time than I was asked to take up, but uh, thanks for listening. That's OK. That's great. Thanks very much, Michael. That's that's really helpful. And just to say we can share the slides at some point if people want to get those and put them on the website. So that's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go straight on to Margaret now for the um, SQA uh, perspective and uh, an update on issues and current um, developments in SQA and in Scotland. So Margaret. Hi, hello Simon and hello everyone. It's great to join the event this evening. Um, I think I'm getting a message that I can't share or maybe maybe it's going to work now. Let's have a look. Uh, yeah, can you see my screen? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Great, okay. Um, so um, uh, great, great to be here this evening, everyone. 
Um, so I'm the Director for Policy Analysis and Standards at SQA. Um, I joined in September, so please don't ask me any difficult questions when we, when we get on to the, to the questions bit. And um, I've worked in lots of different qualification and curriculum bodies uh, across the UK, but I haven't covered Wales yet. So, um, so Kevin, who knows, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get to Wales at some point, but uh, uh, I'm at SQA in Scotland for now. Um, so in terms of, of, of the qualifications uh, system in Scotland, uh, it's an open qualifications market in Scotland. So um, English and Welsh awarding bodies are able to offer qualifications in Scotland. But SQA, the, the Scottish Qualifications Authority, is the main um, awarding organisation in Scotland. Um, it does have a huge range of qualifications covering academic and vocational. Um, so I don't think there is a subject that isn't covered by SQA. It really is um, quite impressive. Um, and, and that's also for academic qualifications, I guess, because SQA is the only um, awarding organisation that can offer the national qualifications that are available in Scotland, the hires and the advanced hires, as well as having a really impressive range of vocational qualifications. So, um, so the, con the concept of parity of esteem that we talk about a lot in education is, is something that SQA definitely strives to have. But, but, but I guess um, as we go through all the, all the reform, I guess there is a tendency um, in Scotland as, as elsewhere to focus slightly more on academic qualifications, which, which continues to be a challenge. Um, SQA, a bit, a bit like SEA, is a non-departmental public body. Um, so it is uh, responsible um, to Scottish ministers and the Scottish Parliament. Um, it was set up under the Education Scotland Act in 1996. Um, and its remit is very much on qualifications and the accreditation of qualifications. So SQA um, self-regulates its own qualifications. So it's national qualifications, hires and advanced hires. Uh, but there is an accreditation unit within SQA, which has responsibility for accrediting qualifications offered in Scotland, but that's on a voluntary basis. So it's, it's slightly different in terms of arrangements for regulation in Scotland. Um, and then in terms of, of the curriculum and the links between um, the SQA qualifications and the curriculum, um, the curriculum in Scotland is, is called Curriculum for Excellence. Um, it's quite similar to uh, the skills-based curriculum in Northern Ireland uh, in that it's based on four capacities, successful learners, confident individuals, effective contributors, responsible citizens. Um, it's got aspirations to ensure that uh, learners can achieve their full potential, have space for individualised, personalised learning, um, can develop skills for life and work, um, and can, you know, uh, I suppose through their development, think about you know digital age, um, contribute, contributing to a global as well as local um, society. And it's meant to be coherent from the age of three up to 18. Um, so it was introduced in schools in 2010, following extensive consultation, which commenced, I think, from 2002. And in parallel with the consultation exercises that were underway to develop and implement the curriculum, extensive consultation and engagement took place between SQA, other education bodies like Education Scotland, um, which was responsible for implementing curriculum for excellence and is responsible for the quality of, of education in Scotland um, to ensure that the SQA national qualifications, so the NQs, the hires and the advanced hires were revised to ensure that they would achieve the aims for curriculum for excellence. So there was significant consultation, co-development um, with a wide range of stakeholder groups to ensure that the revised qualifications, which were introduced from, uh, I think it's 20, 
13 with the first certification in 2015 for the national uh, five qualifications um, to try to ensure that they did fulfill the aims of, of curriculum for excellence um, and then the other qualifications so the highs and advanced highs were rolled out on a slightly later um, basis allowing that kind of staggering however a, a key theme for, for curriculum for excellence and the revised qualifications was this idea that schools and colleges shouldn't feel obliged to take all of those qualifications um, so they could mix and match or even skip a particular qualification um, and focus perhaps on hires or, or indeed advanced hires. Um, so it was meant to introduce that flexibility and the revised qualifications were very much focused on having lots of internal assessments and a unit approach um, to support good assessment. Um, so in many respects, um, these revised qualifications um, had only really recently um, been introduced and perhaps hadn't fully embedded um, when, when COVID uh, came along. Um, so there's been a lot of disruption for everyone across the UK, um, but it's been quite interesting, I think, to look at the, the implications of the, of the disruption in Scotland specifically uh, and the impact on its, its aspirations to introduce the revised qualifications that it had hoped would fulfill the aspirations of curriculum for excellence. So, um, so obviously we had alter alternative awarding in 2020 um, and in 2021 in Scotland as, as elsewhere. Um, following the, the issues that arose in 2020, there's been a big move in Scotland to have um, very representative groups covering learners, parents, um, education experts, teacher unions involved in, in the policy to shape alternative arrangements. And that's now become quite established, I think, in, in terms of the, the, the arrangements to govern policy decisions around qualifications in Scotland. Um, so for, for 2022, uh, there were modifications made to national qualifications with learner revision guides, quite similar to other parts of the UK, but also um, this alternative appeal system, which enabled students who had a, a higher teacher estimated grade, which um, has, a, has a bit more um, significance, I think, in Scotland than perhaps elsewhere in, in other parts of the UK. If they had a higher teacher estimated grade, they were able to put forward their alternative evidence, so their naturally occurring centre-based evidence, and have that evidence reviewed and have a grade based um, on that basis. Um, so quite, a, quite a, a kind of emphasis on teacher assessment, um, even though when the, uh, the revised qualifications were introduced sort of back in that kind of 2013 um, phase, quite soon after implementation, the revised qualifications had to be amended because um, the main teacher union in Scotland, EIS, in particular complained about issues to do with the, with the new curriculum for excellence qualifications in terms of um, issues around workload and burden in terms of the new unit structure and teacher assessment. So whilst everybody was grappling with, with all the significant challenges and new arrangements, um, which you know, were common across the whole of the UK, at the same time, um, in Scotland, Gordon Stopart produced um, a really comprehensive report building on an OECD report which focused on the Scottish curriculum and issues to do with implementation. And in his report, Gordon tried to explore, you know, what, what these issues were that were arising in terms of implementation of the curriculum for excellence in Scotland, um, you know, which was, which was radical and, um, you know, commendable in terms of its aims. Um, so that report is well worth reading if you haven't already, because it looks at that, that kind of, the conflicts, if you like, that arise between having external assessment um, and, and a society that's still placing a high value on external exams. 
so in in Gordon's report, he talks about the fact that whilst the, the curriculum for excellence revised qualifications encouraged a move away from taking high stakes exams um, at the end of every year from age 16, not many centres developed that approach. There seemed to be this reliance on external exams at the end of um, the different um, year group endings, you know, age 16, 17 and 18. So centres didn't seem to really um, take advantage of the flexibility they were given to implement the curriculum for excellence um, in the way that it had been intended. Um, so from that, um, I'm, I'm going range... to ask you, sorry, Margaret, I'm going to have to ask you in fairness to Kevin to... Um... Oh, yeah, OK, to speed up. Yeah, so from, from that, there were a number of reforms put in place. So Ken Muir's review of Scottish bodies in Scotland. Um, there's Louise Hayward's independent review of qualifications and assessment, which is looking at how might qualifications change again in Scotland to achieve the aims for curriculum for excellence. There's also... a a consultation exercise on curriculum for excellence and um, you know the vision for education in Scotland and the skills development um, review being led by James Withers to look at apprenticeships and the specific role of skills development Scotland. So there's an awful lot of reform going on. Um, Louise Hayward's review is now at stage two. We've just had a public consultation um, it's very exciting in that it's exploring um, quite radical changes to qualifications in Scotland. But a key thing about it is the model that it's using for consultation. So it has community collaborative groups, public consultations, and this uh, really impressive independent review group giving advice throughout um, the different stages of the review. And you can see those stages there. Um, so in terms of next steps for Scotland, um, modifications are continuing for 2022. So there's still a lot of disruption and alternative arrangements to manage for this summer. Those will continue um, into 2023 and beyond. Um, so we're already looking at arrangements as to whether we should have further modifications for qualifications in 2024, which is quite different to England in particular. Everybody is waiting to see the outcome of Louise's, um, Louise Hayward's independent review of qualifications uh, in terms of further changes that might happen. And it's exciting in a way, but it does hold up other developments um, in some respects. And at the same time, all the key education bodies in Scotland are being radically uh, reshaped. Um, so quite a lot of change amongst all the staff and, and, and groups that need to manage all the change coming out of Louise Hayward's work and any change that might come out of the review of Curriculum for Excellence. And I'll stop there to make sure Kevin's got some time. That's great, Margaret. Thanks very much for that. Sorry to um, interrupt, but in fairness to Kevin, um, so no, absolutely. he gets a slot. So straight on to Kevin from um, the Welsh Government perspective. Kevin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I just check that colleagues can see the, the, big, the big slide on the screen? Yeah, uh, perfect. Thanks, Simon. So, so um, thanks very much for, for taking the time to come and um, listen to what we've got to say about Wales. Uh, first thing I think to say about Wales is on the grounds that we always get put in alphabetical order behind Northern Ireland and Scotland, we're going to move to rename ourselves Ardavac land um, just, just so that we get the full 10 minutes, right? So I, I'm going to just set my timer, actually, if you don't mind, because I want, I want people to have a chance to ask questions. So I'm, I'm setting a timer on seven minutes and I'll, when it goes off, I stop talking. Yeah, that's, that's one of the rules. So um, if I start with the, the brief for tonight is, um, my name's Kevin Palmer, I'm from Welsh Government. I'm a, a Deputy Director in Welsh Government with responsibility for um, workforce engagement and professional learning. And so I'm going to talk about the curriculum as, as the context of, of what we do along with other things, but then much more about you know, what we're actually doing um, as a response to the, the demands of the curriculum. So if I start with context first, very quickly, um, 
this is this is what we're going to talk through for the, just the next um, six minutes and 23 seconds. Firstly, give you the context of the briefing really, really quickly. Um, then talk about our response to that context in terms of professional learning, in terms of pedagogy and practice. And finally, to talk about leadership of change, because so much of what you're going to hear in the next six minutes or so uh, really is about managing significant system level change. So we start with context. Um, four things to, to talk about quite quickly. The first is curriculum. And what I want to say about curriculum is um, we've, we've heard our curriculum described as uh, skills driven in the past. Not, not quite right. Um, what we have is a purposes driven curriculum. There's quite a lot of relationship with the curriculum for excellence in Scotland. Um, and it's driven by a set of four purposes, kind of the sort of thing you, you've already heard already from Scotland, underpinned by a set of quite high level what matters statements, which are um, organised in areas of learning and experience. So just, just to pause on that, that term, areas of learning and experience, which are kind of multidisciplinary areas that don't, um, as it were, do away with teaching subjects, but contextualize the teaching of subjects and wrap that around with the realization of experiences for the, the purpose of, of meeting the four purposes. And what that gets you to in terms of curriculum is much more autonomy, subsidiarity, as, as Graham Donaldson calls it, at school level. Um, and that is for the for the from the beginning of schooling up until the end of uh, year nine or what we used to call key stage three which will obviously lead us into a conversation or a comment in a few minutes about um about qualifications so the second part of of the reform agenda in wales along with the curriculum is um is aln reform uh, along with and that is a legislative reform process that is that is designed to change the experiences that our uh, learners with additional learning needs have. And then, of course, we're a post-COVID environment, just as everybody else is, with all of the pressures that, that are brought to bear on the system by being post-COVID. And I want to say something when we get toward the end uh, about quals and about how quals can be part of the reform agenda and, on, and what we do actually if quals are not aligned with the new curriculum in terms of the, ref, the reform agenda. So on to the kind of what are we doing about it, a couple of slides on professional learning uh, and then one on pedagogy and one on leadership. So in terms of professional learning, um, our quite early response to um, the challenges and opportunities of the new curriculum was to develop the thing we call the National Approach to Professional Learning. Uh, you'll see a slide there. You, you, you're welcome, if you want to know more, to look at this on Welsh Government Hub website. And what that slide does is provide a set of design imperatives for our professional learning partners, our strategic partners in PL, uh, to give them a clearer sense of um, how we go from the school learner to the purposes, to the professional learner, to a range of design imperatives around PL. And, and the, po the point about that really was to ensure that we got a clearer picture of what PL would look like in every corner of the country. Uh, it had been prior to this um, quite inconsistent. There, there were um, there were wide ranges of access to PL, of quality of PL when it when it was accessed. And so we felt it was important to at least set out a set of conditions and standards that would apply to PL wherever that happened in the country. That was followed, I'll go to the next slide, by the next iteration of that, which was the National Professional Learning Entitlement. Um, and what the National Professional Learning Entitlement seeks to do is take the NAPL, the professional, the national approach, and articulate it in terms of the entitlement that practitioners in our schools have to professional learning. You'll see a, a, an example slide there, and it says very quickly, if you look across the middle, as a practitioner, this is what I'm expected to do. Um, in terms of effective practice, this is what it looks like in relation to our professional standards. And the flip side of that is what the system will make available to me in terms of my entitlement. So things like INSET, things like our regional consortia, our school improvement partners providing a high quality PL, um, things like our national approach to uh, professional inquiry, very much guided by Mark uh, Priestley at Stirling. So, you know, trying to learn from, from across the country, um, ensuring that whatever job you do, in whatever kind of school it is, in whatever language you're operating, in whatever part of the country, you get equity of access to effective professional learning. Uh, I'll go on to the next slide, which is about pedagogy and practice. And um, what we determined quite quickly um, in the, the journey was 
our school teachers need to be developed in a form of thinking about pedagogy, thinking about what makes learning happen in a way that's a little bit different from what had happened in the past in the context of the national curriculum. So we've got this thing, I think I, I think our colleagues in Scotland call it the big bladder uh, for, for the Scots. We've got a national pedagogy conversation which engages literally thousands of our school teachers on a, a monthly basis. And it's based around what's on the screen here, which is a deeper systemic understanding of what makes learning work and how it is specifically and identifiably a thing for us in our uh, for our practitioners in Wales and and finally kind of the other side of it is is leadership of change and what we did in order to enable leadership of change was establish a thing called the National Academy for Educational Leadership and on the screen there you'll see the things that the academy does it quality assurance PA it invests in innovation it provides us in government with insight into what's happening in the school system enabling us to, to perform more effectively in relation to strategic, to strategic workforce development and essentially is um, the bridge between what could be in, in, in any system a government with the potential to operate remotely and our key workforce of, of head teachers and leaders across the country. Now my little bleep is about to go off, you may hear it, so um, there it goes. I'll stop sharing um, and come back on to screen. Kevin, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. And um, th that's excellent. Um, there's been a number of questions posed in the um, in the chat, which everybody can see. The, the one thing I was going to um, start the ball rolling with, if that's OK, was to just ask, and I, if you don't mind, I'm going to go to, to Kevin first and then go to Margaret and, and then Michael. It's around this issue of um, involving teachers in the the process of development and particularly around assessment and um, building assessment expertise amongst the teaching workforce, if I can call it that. Um, and you've you've touched on it. I think you've all touched on it in different ways. But given the, the remit of the CIA and what we're trying to do in terms of promoting excellence in assessment and actually building bridges between institutions and developing that expertise, I just wondered if you'd say a little bit more about how the structures and the things that you've referred to have actually focused on developing that expertise and what other plans you've got on the stocks to take that further to support the sort of reforms you're talking about. So I'll go to Kevin, then Margaret, and then to um, Michael. Kevin, you're, you're still on mute. Okay, so yeah, yeah, just just two or three things to make space for others. Firstly, um, the concept of assessment was um, deliberately co-constructed in the process of the creation of the new curriculum, and we never say assessment without without saying progression. So we always talk about assessment and progression, and reframing our teachers' understanding of what assessment does in order to enable uh, and to demonstrate progression up until the point to which you know it's kind of you've got to assess for quals and so on and still we need more flexible and responsive approaches to assessment we, it's my view and I think my view the view of colleagues in in the curriculum team that we need as wide a range of assessment tools as we can bring to bear, even on those areas of assessment that lead to qualification. So that's been a co-construction process. Um, the pedagogy conversation that I just mentioned is heavily weighted toward conversations about assessment, about what that means in the classroom and about how we make it valid and reliable. Um, and I'm certain that as I go forward into the next, because um, I'm doing it right now, as I go into the next financial year, planning for what our strategic partners are gonna do, they will certainly be focused on um, on working in assessment for learning, assessment as learning, the usual stuff, but also post-COVID and, and the new qualifications environment, thinking about how we sharpen the toolkit that we've got in terms of assessment for quals. Okay, thanks. Um, Margaret? Okay, um, so I think um, I think I, I suppose one of the issues with the implementation for Curriculum for Excellence, which was maybe intended to um, put a bit more emphasis on teacher assessment is, but I believe one of the issues for the union was that the time they had to kind of build up their assessment practice and pedagogy 
wasn't sufficient to, to fulfill the, the aspirations of curriculum for excellence. And then we've had all the disruption from COVID and, and um, the teacher assessment element was, was reduced uh, in the qualifications. And what's interesting now is that whilst we have this alternative evidence system uh, running to support um, the COVID disruption, there's, there's, there's almost this clash occurring in terms of um, the types of evidence that, that are being put through and the expectations of SQA as an exam body that's used to um, you know, operating to kind of very high standards. So I, I think there's, there's quite a lot of work to be done in terms of supporting the sector, in terms of, you know, working with them on um, assessment. In, and, it, and it's a topic that comes up in terms of as SQA becomes a new qualifications body. So it is focused on qualifications. It's not a professional learning or support agency. How might it work better and differently with the new Education Scotland, which is also being reformed and reshaped to ensure that we've got that kind of synergy in terms of assessment um, through the key stages that, that support learners in terms of, you know, whatever qualifications they might be taking, whether it's vocational or academic, that good assessment practice is is there. And we did, in fact, mention the Chartered Institute of Exams and Assessment um, this week in terms of being a body that could perhaps help Scotland uh, in terms of assessment practice. OK, thanks, Margaret. Now, Michael. Uh, yeah, I, th I think from, from, from a Northern Ireland perspective, as I said, you know, the, at the beginning of my presentation, the Northern Ireland curriculum itself is, is, is roughly about 15 years old at this point, um, coming up to 16. And we obviously um, within it had the, uh, there was a real focus on the assessment of cross curricular skills of using ICT, using maths and communication, and then the thinking skills and personal capabilities. And I think it is fair to say that on implementation, there were obviously still an awful lot of sort of refinements required there to ensure the schools understood exactly what the expectation was. Now, also as well, I think, um, and, and Kevin made reference to this, the assessment for learning, it, it was a really, it was, it was a, a, a key element of, of the Northern Ireland curriculum and trying to move away from, from the summit of assessment that schools were so focused on previously to much more formative means of assessment. And I think even in the qualification space, so at GCSE and A level, for example, it was trying to even take good practice that would have been adopted by teachers at Key State Street and trying to see if there was any way of incorporating that into the delivery of qualifications to try and again sort of further develop and, and, and refine students' um, experiences um, when they were being prepared for, for, for high stakes assessments. Now, also as well, um, what, what we did and uh, when, when I say we, um, I think Margaret won't mind me saying it was something that she was a, she was a trailblazer when, when, in her time at SIA, obviously with the work that we had carried out and monitoring the curriculum, and it was, it was something that, that, that she um, um, led on really to, to see how effective it was performing um, uh, when, when she had come in to SIA. And broadly positive experiences were being shared by schools, a few um, refinements were required, but then again, I think a lot of the work and a lot of the recommendations that come out of the monitoring curric of, of the curriculum exercise were then halted because of COVID. And I think, you know, all of the jurisdictions would say it has really sort of set us all back. Um, now, as, as an organization, we at SEER are actually revisiting key concepts associated with the, with the Northern Ireland curriculum, both internally and externally to try and, um, nearly reintroduce and, and, and refresh schools to the sort of the benefits um, that it does afford. And also as well, um, I made reference to the independent review of education and one of the key requirements of it is obviously to enhance the sort of the curricular provision um, that is that is that is uh, that was intended and access to the curriculum for all pupils. So I think it is it, it, the, the whole work around assessment will be ongoing from a Northern Ireland perspective. Um, to see if, if it can be improved and enhanced over the coming years. Okay, thanks for that. Um, linked onto this, and again, I'll go, go around Ke Kevin, um, Margaret, and then back to Michael. Um, the link, um, and Nick flagged this up about um, between professional learning curriculum development delivery and um, 
how that's sort of central to a lot of the things you've talked about and the reaction of teachers to that in relation to the workload issues that we hear about and, and frame a lot of the reactions to some of the innovations and the reforms that are being um, proposed uh, uh, and implemented. And I, I wondered if you'd just talk in terms of the jurisdictions, well, what have the teachers' reactions been to some of those things? So, Kevin. Yeah, the teachers' reactions to the co-construction of the new curriculum for Wales were immensely positive, in, including head teachers. Um, and the message that I I got from them and shared with them was, this isn't new job, this is the job, right? So, so actually, the curriculum is what we do, and if we're going to reform the curriculum, uh, then what we're investing in is a better version of the the day job, and that's a, that's a better version of the day job for everybody. What we what we value about the new curriculum is not just the experiences it realizes for children and young people, it's the opportunities it affords for professionals to realize their own creativity. So, uh, you know, as a principle, that, that always landed really well for the first three or four years. Um, then when you come to the workload questions, especially during and after COVID, there are pressures there, clearly there are pressures there. Um, the, our two ways of, of managing those pressures with our colleagues in the system are to talk about two things in the Welsh environment. The first is schools as learning organisations, and we say schools as learning organisations isn't an additional job, it's the job you need to do if you've got serious change to handle, and that is a significant contribution to the progress that schools are making. And the final thing that we did very early on was refresh our professional standards for teaching and leadership and then our professional standards for learning support so there's a new set of professional standards that is culturally aligned with the expectations of the new curriculum and do that same job of saying this is this is a different approach to teaching and learning and assessment in our schools this is a different approach to professional uh, expectations and responsibilities and, sh and in short if you are a teacher working in line with the professional standards and you're working in a school that's a learning organization, we can throw anything at it. You know, COVID has thrown all sorts of challenges that the SLO model has helped us with. Um, the, the realization of the new curriculum will have, you know, there are further challenges uh, to, to address there, but not, not to dodge the question. Yeah, of course, like everybody else in the UK and across the OECD world we do have to address issues of workload in our workforce it would not be it would not be fair to to, to not acknowledge that okay margaret uh, okay thanks simon so uh, i've said a, a bit about workload um in terms of the the, the revised qualifications um i mean a bit like kevin a theme coming through covid and SQA has completed quite comprehensive evaluation exercises through each of the years of COVID. Um, our, you know, the themes are around the workload pressures on, on teachers with, with the alternative awarding system. And indeed this year for 2022, we haven't published our evaluation yet. It will be published in, um, in March, but the key things around the alternative evidence system are, are around fairness and also around workload. I think because the Curriculum for Excellence is, is quite well established as a, um, as a programme in Scotland, I think the issues coming through from, from school and college leaders is really about how they manage all the aspirations of the curriculum. And maybe I think someone's put a comment on this in the chat, you know, the accountability framework that they perhaps feel under pressure, you know, to perform against. Um, so while they acknowledge that there is flexibility in the curriculum for excellence, that they don't have to take, um, you know, a load of nat fives at age 16 and then move on to hires and advanced hires, they feel that there is pressure in society and from employers and from higher education institutions to carry on delivering all of those qualifications and everything else that supports the education system in terms of initial teacher training and timetabling, you know, everything is sort of established to carry on doing what they've what they've always done. And I think that's why the independent review group is looking at, you know, how do we change that quite quite radically and, and, the, and the four capacities that support the curriculum for excellence. If we want change, should we actually assess those? So whilst they're an entitlement, people and learners don't feel that they are developing or covering them. So do we need something that really acknowledges and recognizes and rewards achievement in those areas? 
you know, do we need a different type of um, sort of end of school baccalaureate style, even though Scotland has got a Scottish baccalaureate, but a different way of encouraging achievement in these other areas that are important to the curriculum for excellence and move away from this focus on qualification grades. And a theme coming through the independent review of qualifications, and it's come through very loud and clear, I think, through the national discussion on curriculum, is that teachers want more time to have conversations and do planning with each other and think about the professional learning. And I, I think it's great, Kevin, to hear what Wales is doing, to, to really think about how they're embedding the curriculum um, and as well as covering all the things that need to be covered in qualifications that parents expect their, their children to achieve to, to get grades that are needed to progress. Okay. Michael, briefly. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, th I think um, in, in terms of uh, workload, yeah, like any, any innovation um, th th that is introduced, it, it's nearly um, th the first um there's to be sacrificed um when it comes to the likes of industrial action and i think we have experienced that over the last number of years um i think pre-covid um a lot of the assessment exercises that we were able to undertake as part of the northern Ireland curriculum were um sacrificed um as as part of that sort of action it always seems to be the first thing that is effective at I think as well, I remember, I think it was Margaret had mentioned the alternative arrangements that were introduced, I think particularly in 2021, and the burden that it placed on teachers, the workload issues with it. Yeah, um, you know, there was obviously a huge degree of kickback, and I think they were glad to see in summer 2022 the gradual return of, of, of high stakes assessments in the form of examinations. Um, also, as well, I, th I think there is, um, you know, what, what we in the start it was intended but we still have problems where qualifications are driving um, curriculum um, delivery and uh, I think as well the extent to which that was actually happening COVID actually gave us an opportunity to see the extent to which um, that was the case in a number of schools because we were obviously able to see you know from an awarding body perspective things like entry patterns and and so on and so forth and, and some of the things that we were seeing was it is clearly not the intention you know that the children at the end of key stage three probably shouldn't be exposed to the to, to the qualifications in the way that they that they were and which we only really uncovered as part of uh, the work that we were doing around covid but other initiatives that we were trying to introduce you know similar to wales uh, introduced by the, the department of education here the likes of learning leaders to try and improve teacher professional learning and we also have have, have a northern ireland wide um, body called the Education Authority who who work with with schools and it's really their job to ensure that the the sort of the practices intended by the Northern Ireland curriculum are um, being followed in schools with the support of our education and training inspectorate. But yeah, workload um, is, is a huge problem and, and I think particularly in the in, in pay disputes that are that are ongoing at the minute, you know the whole assessment regime is something that will probably um, end up paying the price, we will end up paying the price for. Okay, um, we're getting towards the end. I'm just going to ask you for a, a very, very quick comment in response to one of the points that Isabel Nesbitt has rightly raised, which is this notion of we've all got, whichever jurisdiction we're in, a duty to support mobile learners because people are moving between jurisdictions and the extent to which that is actually a reality taken on board in these reviews and these reforms because, you know, as we see sort of divergence and differences appearing, to what extent is that taken into account? Somebody mentioned earlier, Michael, I think that, you know, IT in Northern Ireland is a big focus because of supporting that. I just wondered how that issue is being taken into account in the sort of reform agendas that you're talking about. But I'm afraid you're only going to have two sentences each person. Kevin first. We have to ensure that the currency of a Welsh GCSE is equal to the currency of a Scottish equivalent or an English GCSE. We, we can't put our learners at risk by messing about with the currency of their quals. What we have to do if we want to realise the curriculum for Wales in a way that is creative and innovative is ensure that we've got gearing between pedagogy assessment and the value of quals. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you, Margaret. Um, yeah, I think um, throughout our SQA's response to all the different reforms, I think we're saying look, we're really up for change and innovation, but we, we must ensure that SQA qualifications remain credible um, and, and, are, and are based on standards. So I think that's really important to ensure that we've got comparability and that students can be mobile. Um, all of the SQA qualifications are based on national occupational standards for the vocational qualification. So that's that's important for Scotland. I know there are issues with other jurisdictions moving away from the from the NOS, but but Scotland is still firmly wedded to the NOS. Um, I was a mobile learner, so I moved around and I needed to get into universities of different parts of, of, of the UK and so on. So I'm 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 very passionate about this point. Okay, and then very briefly, Michael. Yeah, Northern Ireland's very, very small, Simon. Um, we we sort of need to piggyback on 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 you know the work that's being done in other jurisdictions. We're keen to to maintain our relationship um, within the three countries, but I think there is some really, really um, uh, innovative ideas within that Northern Ireland curriculum. And I think from our perspective, it is balancing the opportunities it affords us with also ensuring that we're offering credible qualifications comparable to those on offer in England, Scotland and Wales, and also as well the Republic of Ireland. Okay, that's great. My clock has just clicked over to um, eight. So I am going to say thank you to Kevin, to Margaret and to Michael for their presentations and for their responses to the questions. Um, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to cover all the questions in the chat, but we will ensure that they are shared with the um, presenters. And if there's specifics, we can get responses back to people where we know who the questioner has been. We'll, we'll capture the questions and put those on the website along with the recording. I'd just like to thank everybody for, for joining this evening. It's been very interesting um, to hear what is going on in the jurisdictions. And again, picking up the point that was made in one of the points on the chat, it's very important that we do keep abreast of what is going on in other countries within our UK so that we do learn from our neighbours, the good and the not so good, and uh, that we do ensure that we're in harmony. So I think, I think it's been really very, very helpful and there's something very interesting developments going on, which I can say, as uh, somebody based in England, um, the English can learn from, absolutely can learn from. So thank you very much indeed to all of you for your contributions. Thank you all for registering for, the, for tonight's event. And as I say, we will get the recording onto the website as soon as we can along with the questions. So thank you very much indeed and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks.